All right, I think we got all the logistics out of the way. Welcome to the first ever, also I don't want the bottom bar there. Welcome to the first uh, Hyperloop workshop for 2023. I, don't know, I can't believe that's how I'm starting that. Today is February 3rd, 2023. And today is the first day of season four for CPP Hyperloop's workshops. We've been doing this for four semesters already which is fun. Um, today, we're going to be dealing with Python applications. So the fundamentals of Python and its applications to game development. So whether you're a computer science major or you're just any other major in general, I think it's a pretty good way and cool way of learning about coding. Uh, so I like to do this kind of like poll thing at the beginning of every you know, workshop. How many of you guys have ever been to a Hyperloop workshop before? Raise your hands. Uh, about half of you, that's cool. One more. <laughs> so um, that's awesome. If you've never been here, pretty much what we do is you know constant workshops every single week. One of the largest workshop programs now here at Cal Poly Pomona, and we do STEM-based workshops uh, constantly. So to preface everything, I just want to thank our collaborators and sponsors. We have CPP Robotics, uh, who is a robotics-based club, just doing small little robotics projects here on campus, and we also have IEEE NTC, which is a separate chapter from IEEE. The club here on campus um, and they are willing to help us with outreach to high schools so as a part of this kind of deal here actually part of our uh, attendees today are high schoolers and they are on zoom so you'll be able to see them but they'll be they'll be able to see me so <laughs> that'll be kind of exciting so as we previously stated the first 30 minutes of this workshop will consist of just getting everyone set up and ready to download um, or just ready to go this morning, I sent out an instructional guide. It's a 26-part instruction guide on downloading Visual Studio Code, Python, and GitHub. In there, I recommended some uh, cool tips on GitHub, and also at the very end, you install Pygame. So if you already have Python, uh, just run a pip install Pygame, a P-Y-G-A-M-E, uh, and that will get you ready for now. But uh, if you have not gotten started yet, uh, please go ahead and follow the instructional manual linked in the Hyperloop Discord announcements. Uh, to download all of Python, it should only take you about 30 minutes to do. Um, and we'll reconvene back at around 6.30 p.m. to start the lecture portion of the Python workshop. So I'm just going to go over this on Zoom so everyone is on the correct page and on the same page and knows what I'm talking about. This is going to be the Python VS Code and GitHub installation guide. It is a 26... Uh, 26 step guide on installing everything. If you are familiar with it or you want to skip some steps, you can use the outline on the side here to go to different chapters of this guide, and this will give you some access to it. Unfortunately, if you're using a Mac, um, I don't have a Mac version, so it's very similar to Windows. But if you're in Windows, this guy is for you. Uh, if you're Mac, you can uh, probably suffice. And you know, it, the main difference is just instead of command prompt, it's terminal. So it goes through installing Python, setup GitHub, polishing your repository, and installing Pygame. Once you get to the finish, um, you are on track and on the right uh, way to uh, do some of the cool things we're going to be doing in this workshop. If you run into any issues, like if your Python is not on path or if your pip's not working, uh, please let me know, and the Hyperloop eboard members will be assisting you. Um, so currently today, we have, I think it's just uh, me and Addy, um, who will be helping you. I, I, do you think you can? Addie is part of Hyperloop, and she'll be going around helping me assist you guys if you need to. Um, unfortunately, I had two other helpers that were originally going to come uh, help us out. Uh, I think Sam and Zach, but unfortunately, I don't think they could make it. So it'll just be us two running around and assisting you guys. So uh, this is the guide. It's on the Hyperloop Discord. It will be on the website once this workshop is complete. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, for the sake of the people watching this uh, right now, I will go ahead and pause the recording and we will return once uh, 30 minutes are up. No, not pause, share. Uh, pause recording. Welcome back. If you're watching on Zoom, uh, you just experienced time travel. Jumped for 30 minutes uh, and now it is time to go over some lecture stuff. You know, I was saying this before I... Uh, I have to click on this thing to debate it. I was saying before that this debugging procedure went a lot smoother than I thought it would because troubleshooting in software is one of the worst, worst things you could ever experience. It's just absolutely horrible. Uh, I remember the first time I debugged that PIP issue that I think I fixed on one of your computers. It took me around like four hours. And it like, 
led me to uninstalling, reinstalling, uninstalling again, and then reinstalling again, restarting my computer. It took me a bunch of things, but you know, the more experience you have with it, the more you narrow down the amount of errors that you have and this sort of thing. So it's cool. Anyways, so welcome to the Python Applications Workshop once more. Uh, in this workshop, we're going, to go, we're going to go over some fundamental uh, topics regarding Python, uh, such as why we you know, code in Python, why we code in the first place, uh, you know, going into some of the logic that goes into Python coding, uh, and more. So if you are a complete beginner uh, or have no experience in coding, to intermediate levels of coding, uh, I hope you can still benefit from this workshop. Uh, so let's begin. So section one is what is coding. And by the way, I section all of my workshops into like these little things. There's nine sections. So uh, I hope that we can get through all of them. We always begin these workshops with, with asking the big question, why code? Why do we do this in the first place? Why do I host these workshops? Why, do you, why are you interested? Why did you take some time out of your Friday to come to this workshop and learn? Why do we code? Uh, there are a few different reasons, but here are some of the basic reasons, uh, really. You know, these days we write code to make our lives easier. We build robots to make our lives easier. That's known as automation, right? We don't want to sit there and look at an Excel sheet of like 834 lines of taxes and have to calculate everything. We would write a Python script or just write an equation in Excel to do everything, right? So something like that is why we write code. It simplifies what we do and it makes our lives so much easier. Okay. Last two are like internet security things, internet access, wireless communication, I think of one more, make and play games. Those are kind of like developments in code. We've moved past, um, you know, the simple stuff. And people these days use code to do a lot of different things. We're not even talking about Python at this point. We're talking about uh, things that weren't, aren't even possible without people who have made coding languages and have done this development. Human society is just amazing in general. So here are some examples of things that have uh, things that you know use code to make. This thing is a series robot. It's a bartender, bartender robot. If you visit places like they have one in Vegas now, but you know they used to originate in like Th Thailand and Singapore. Uh, they have robots that make you drinks like coffee, tea, and even like bar drinks like alcohol. So pretty cool. Uh, you need code to make that. This is a quantum computer. Uh, we're moving into you know scientists that can actually make one of these quantum computers instead of using digital logic. Um, they're basically saying bits that can be one or zero can be both one and zero at the same time. So pretty much calculating things has just become a thing of the past. It's pretty instant. We're still very far away from the first quant real quantum computer, but we're getting pretty dang close. So as human society uh, you know, keeps developing and keeps researching, as technology increases, we're soon to see computers do like instant calculations like in a snap, pretty much getting solving that Bitcoin in like a millisecond. So why Python? Of all the programming languages, there's like C, C++, Rust, Ruby, uh, Java, JavaScript, assembly. Why do we start with Python? Now, the answer differs from people to people, but generally it's because Python is the most simple logic language and has the most simple syntax in order to start programming. You know, a lot of people who didn't start with Python complain that Python is terrible, mainly because, you know, there's no semicolons, it's focused on indentation instead of, you know, like real formatting. But Python in general is really easy for beginners. If you want to learn how to code and you don't care about the nitty gritty about learning like type safe uh, data or like types of data, start with Python. It's easier to wrap your mind around. It's also compatible with many libraries and architectures. So a little brief history about Python. Uh, a lot of the libraries are actually C++ libraries. Python is actually coded from C++. It's kind of like the simpler version of that, in a sense. So uh, a lot of the libraries that are made for Python, like Pygame, which we're going to do today, or OpenCV, a computer vision library, or Python Sockets, which is for wireless communication, is based off of C++ and like previous libraries that happen. So it's just making your life easier, you know? Oh, I spoiled it a little bit. That's Python up there, print hello world. And this is Java. I believe it's also doing the same code. So you can see the complexity change from Python to Java like this. And you see Java's a little bit more complicated. You usually take an entire course on this. You can probably learn, understand that in like, well, you guys here have all understand it already because you already did the test code, right? 
as hello world. And everyone pretty much got it. So very cool. This is assembly. Um, and this is hello world and assembly. So all of these three codes basically say the same thing. Uh, you wouldn't want to do this, right? I wouldn't. So that's why we stick with Python. Java's OK, uh, but I feel like it's a little more advanced than learning Python in general, at least for a two hour workshop. Here's. Yeah, C sharp is. Um, it's like Python. Uh, no, it's like Java, but like. Uh, Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, Java is sponsored by Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. So C sharp is usually used for. I'll, I'll go over it really quickly. C, C sharp, and C are like in the same family. Uh, but they do different things. And C sharp is usually used for game development. Uh, Unity uses C sharp a lot. Uh, and you know, if you take ECE 2310, you'll use C sharp. Uh, it's also used for object oriented programming. So it's similar to Java, but branded. So yeah, that, that, that is kind of true. That is kind of true. Um, so everything on the left here is known as what's a high level language. So high level languages are pretty easy to understand. They contain of a lot of high level functions, pretty much one liners that do a lot of things. So Python is on the top of this because literally like you could do a lot with just one line. You could call a function that just does a whole bunch of stuff. Same with like pretty much the rest. C++ is used for Arduino, if you want to do that sort of thing. C Sharp used for game development. Java used for app development. Uh, JavaScript used for web development. Uh, Ruby and Rust are kind of like just there, but they're still high level functions. Everything on the right is low level function, characterized as you have to individually move the ones and zeros inside of the microcontroller to do what you want. Very familiarly, you'll do this using Arduino, because Arduino is kind of like uh, both of these, but um, assembly, Verilog, and machine language, these are kind of hard, I'm going to say. Some people actually start coding using these languages, but you saw the assembly hello world, right? I don't need to go into that. Um, for these, you have to individually modify the ones and zeros using machine language, which is just literally ones and zeros. Assembly and Verilog are kind of like a step up from that. But the good thing about doing low level languages and individually moving bits and registers to accomplish your goals is because this is so much faster than the ones on the left. If you're caring about saving a few milliseconds or shaving a few nanoseconds off your runtime, use the ones on the right. Otherwise, if you're just learning, left is fine. There's some nerds out there that are really concerned about like how fast their code runs because it, it literally makes the difference between like a million dollar code and a dollar code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Cool, we're done with section one. Let's move on to data types. And we're, I'm going to try to move relatively quickly along this line because um, we're running short of time. But really brief understanding, there's common data types, like an integer. Integer just means a whole number, uh, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Doubles uh, in Python, it can be like 0 0.01. Decimal numbers, you can think of it like that as a basic understanding of it. Floats are kind of like the same thing. And you, you might ask, like, oh, why is it the same? Like, both decimal numbers, right? Um, if you look even closer at like low level languages, doubles are a lot larger than floats, which means they can contain more numbers than floats. Uh, and it all adheres to what's known as the IEEE 754 standard. If you don't understand what that is, you don't have to right now, but you can Google it later. I'm just throwing it out there. In Python, doubles and floats aren't really characterized as anything different. They're just like the same number. We just call them doubles. String is like a word. You can store a string inside of Python. Character is a single character inside of a string. Um, in reality, string is like an array of characters, like multiple different characters. Um, but you know, car is just one of them. Car is also very uh, related to ASCII. You know what ASCII is. Uh, and ASCII is a way of representing each character or alphanumeric character uh, using a number. Bool is a good data type. It's either true or false, right? It's really great to use for like flags in games and saying if something happens or not. It's like a yes or no question, right? List. List and arrays are pretty much the same. They can store, they're like a storage cabinet for data, right? 
if I t told you to like put these inside variables, which we'll talk about in a bit, variables are like a single storage unit. Lists are multiple storage units. You can put anything in them. Think of like throwing like a series of boxes in front of you and then throwing in like a three, a high, or a false from this list. Dictionary. Now we're moving into Python. Python has this really interesting structure called a dictionary. Dictionaries operate like lists. They are a data structure, except they have a key and a value. Think of like opening a dictionary, right? If you're looking at a dictionary, you find a word and then its definition. In dictionaries, they're organized the same way. You have the word, which is the key, and the definition, which is the value. And looking through a dictionary to find your word is the same as looking through a dictionary to find something else, right? You use dictionaries usually to store things like names and addresses. You can store like account information, like if I log into my account and see how much money I have, uh, how much I, yeah, how much money I have and whatnot, you know. A tuple is pretty cool. It's an immutable object, right? And in Python, especially for OpenCV and Pygame, you use tuples to represent coordinates. It's really cool because you can't change the length of this thing, right? Sets, kind of the same as the dictionary, except you can store multiple different data types in it. Versatile. And struct. Struct is not in Python. It's uh, mostly in C and C++. There is a uh, library that you can install to have structs there, I will say. And objects, we're not going to get into uh, object-oriented programming today, but if you get into that, oh, that's what an object is. Arithmetic. I, I realized I didn't have a variable slide here, but variables are pretty important inside programming languages in general. Again, they're a storage container for something, like a, a box, right? Like if I said this was my variable, then I can put stuff inside of it. And usually the stuff that we put in is, was in the previous slide. All the data types we talked about can fit inside a variable. Python is great because you don't need to define variables. You can just say like, oh, my variable name is var, and var equals something. In other languages, it's kind of a pain in the butt because you got to define it, but lucky for us, Python is not type safe. <laughs> Arithmetic, you can add, you can subtract, you can divide, you can multiply. Uh, here's a fun one, what's h times 10? You can only do this in Python. Anyone? It's h, 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 You can multiply characters. Python's fun like that. <laughs> you can do modulus. Modulus is uh, kind of a fancy one. It's kind of like with the remainder. So if you use modulo, like 10 modulo 4, it'll spit out the remainder of this operation if you divide it. Right? So 10 divided by 4 is like 2 with 2 remainder, like in elementary math. So you get 2 as the output. Float division. So if you do float division, like 10 float division 3, you only get the whole number and everything after it gets chopped off. It's different from just a single division, right? Because single division, you get a repeating number. This one, you just get it chopped off. Great if you want whole numbers at the end. That's it. Section 3, comparisons. OK, so before we get into if statements, which is usually the next thing you do when you get into Python, we're going to start by making a few uh, pretty hopefully obvious comparisons. So just a yes or no question. A tree is a living thing, yes or no? Yeah, so in, in, in coding we say true, right? True, good. Gravity does not exist. Is this statement true or false? False. Yeah, good. A grape is a fruit. True, right? Great. <laughs> An ice cube is a solid. Okay, good. Now let's do some more complicated ones that might lead into coding. Five is larger than three. True? Great, awesome. Negative five is larger than nine. Did I fix this one? False? Okay, good, I fixed the one. <laughs> I remember last semester this was wrong. <laughs> two is the same as two. Now be careful here because um, this symbol, equals equals, it's what we use when comparing two things in Python, not a single equal sign. So is that true or false? True. Yes. And finally, two is less than six. OK, good. <laughs> so for a quick guide, uh, when you do comparisons inside code, and by the way, you can like open the compiler and type these phrases in. I'm not, I'm not going to do it now because of time. You can do less than, less than equals, greater than, greater than equals, equal to. 
And remember that equals to is equals equals. Does anyone know why we don't use a single equal sign for this? A sign, right, yes. A single equal sign is assignment. So it's a variable declaration. So you're, if you want to say um, like a box, like if I have a variable as a box and I want to put something inside the box, I say the box equals mouse. I put the mouse inside, right? That's assigning. But double equal sign, it means comparing to. So if I do the box double equal sign to mouse, then what would the compiler spit out at me? False, right? Because it's not equal, right? And plus the box has like keychains inside of it, so. <laughs> not equal to, if you don't want to do like not equal to, so like let's say the box not equal to mouse, no, that would be true. Uh, you can use exclamation mark equal sign or the not symbol. And we'll go over the not symbol in a little bit. Okay. Now that we've talked about that, Does anyone get this meme? For those of you who, who went here last, last semester, don't, don't have to say anything. <laughs> so it says, oh no, the robots are killing us. But why? We never programmed them to do this. And here's the code for the robot. So I think the big question to ask is, why is the crazy robot uh, killing the humans? <laughs> You see it? It's assigning true to crazy murdering robot. So it's saying the crazy murdering robot is true. So it's going to kill the humans. No. Oh. No, it's not. It's going to. Oh, so wait. But that's not a condition. That's an assignment. Right. So it's assigning crazy murdering robot to true. But if you have an if statement oh. and you put true inside the if statement. Oh, OK, OK. Now, technically, it is. Yeah, it's a condition. You can put bools inside of if statements, which we're going to talk about next, and it will like operate the same. So you got to be careful. Now, Python is kind of smart. Python's uh, compiler is called IntelliSense on Visual Studio Code. It will catch this sometimes and it will warn you, did you mean double equal sign? But not always. It's like kind of a human error, so be careful about this. This happens, by the way. Like sometimes I'll write a huge 1,000 line of code, and I'm like, I don't know why it's not working, and I like, uh, inspect my code and see. It does happen. <laughs> so comparing two statements, you can use the word and or or. In Python, you can just write and literally there. In C or C++, you need to use ampersands, right? So for and, both statements have to be true in order for the full statement to be true. We're moving into what's called conditionals here. So statement A has to be true and statement 2 has to be true in order for the whole thing to be true. Otherwise, it'll return false. Statement one or statement two. Now, if there's an or, only one has to be true this time. So if statement one is true, statement two is false, the whole thing is still true, right? The not keyword. So this is a special comparison or conditional we're going to talk about because it's really good for catching uh, errors, and it's much faster than doing a not equal sign sometimes. And sometimes when you get used to it, it's actually like pretty easy. It's kind of like caviar or something or oysters or something that you, you have to like to have a taste it a lot to, for it to be good you know anyways so in this case a is going to be an empty string which means that if i do not a it's going to equal true if, if this is the first time you're seeing this it's going to be a little bit to wrap your head around right so basically i'm saying not a so if a is empty then not nothing is true or not false is true right If B is zero, so the first one was talking about strings or cars, right? So empty strings is true. What about zero? Zero is also true if you do not zero, right? Because zero is kind of like false. So not false is true. Oh, well, we all know bools, right? Not false equals true. And finally, if you have an empty list, empty dictionary, or another empty object, you can do not D equals true, basically saying uh, it's empty. This is the most important one out of all of them to note, especially because if you're working with computer vision or other robotics that, you know, send an expected data packet to you, but if it's empty, that's really, really bad. Before I move on, right, I just want to say, like, in a project I'm working on, because I work with drones, um, an example of really, really bad 
is when something like camera data doesn't come back to me, right? Because if I send a drone off and I expect I to see the drone's camera continuously, and I store my camera data inside that list over here, right? I expect there to be something uh, coming into me every second. Now, if something doesn't happen, if there's nothing in that list, I have to know immediately because that means I don't know where the heck my drone went. Probably lost connection, something broke, a pigeon flew into it, you know? So it's really important I use not empty list in this case to catch the fact that my camera didn't have a packet. So because it could be a multitude of issues. It could be that maybe the connection just broke, right? In that case, I would just use a pass. I would just continue on doing things. Or the drone just completely failed. In that case, that's really bad. I kind of need to know that, right? So in many applications, using the not keyword or just the not equal sign is a good thing, right? Because you can do troubleshooting. You can catch edge cases and find the abnormalities in a data set. Example of this is if you're doing your taxes, right? And you're trying to find one line, or you, you don't even know that line, but basically your taxes are 1,500 lines long. You don't have time to catch all lines or whatever. So you run your script through a Python script, which has the not keyword, basically says, oh, on line 243, you didn't have a uh, tax line there or something. I don't know. You didn't have an invoice. But it's good for catching up abnormality. So if, something, if you miss something, you can find it. That's the gist of it. Conditionals. So we talked about comparisons, right? A tree is a living thing, that's a comparison. You can stuff them in conditionals. Uh, we're not talking about that yet, though. We're going to talk about flowcharts. So in most cases for Python, all code is procedural. They follow a pattern. So something like this. You know, you have a start, and you have task one, and then you do task two, and then you do task three, and you do task four, and you go to the finish. Most code is like this at a very high level. However, sometimes it looks like this because you have a choice, right? When you wake up in the morning, do you get out of bed or not? You know, if you say yes, you're not out of bed. Otherwise, if you say no, you hit the snooze button and something else happens. It's a pretty life thing to say that choices make or break the day, right? If we make the right choices, hooray. If we make bad choices, uh, not so hooray. But, you know, you can represent choices in code using if statements. Using diamonds, that's how we know there's a choice to be made. Here's another example. Something like Netflix or Hulu or streaming platforms. You finish an episode of your favorite show. Do you want to watch another one? Yes, you watch another one. No, you stop watching the show and doing something more productive, right? This is actually a loop because you're going back and doing another thing and then you're gonna keep doing this until you, know, you see the light of day. <laughs> if statements, okay. You're gonna put your comparison or conditional inside the if statements. If your conditional is true, you're gonna run stuff underneath it, right? Provides choice dependent on a true or false statement. If it's false, it's going to skip everything underneath the if statement. You know, unless you have an else statement. So you're going to put your comparison here, right? Say like a tree is a living thing, right? Or three is greater than one. If the comparison is true, you're going to run the code that's inside this block. If the comparison is false, like they say gravity is not a thing, you know, you're going to go to else, you're going to run the code in this block if comparison one is false. Everyone get that? Pretty self-explanatory? Cool. Else if. Now, the most common example for else if is like the grade example. Uh, you know, you have to like get a list of grades and then like see if the grade is an A or B or C. You're turning a number into a letter. We did it the last time, so if you want to check that out, um, it's in season three, 3x01. But else if statements, you can have multiple if and else statements that can be used for multiple results. So if you have something different that happens every time, you can go ahead and run that through if, elif, elif, elif. You can have, you can have infinite amounts of elif statements, um, but you know it's good to have at least one else statement just in case all of your comparisons are false, right? So comparison one, if comparison one is true, we're going to run code underneath it. But if comparison one is false, we're going to skip to the next statement to check comparison two. If comparison two is true, we're going to run the code underneath it. Otherwise, we're going to skip and go to comparison three. If comparison three is true, we're going to run the code underneath it. Otherwise, we're going to jump to the next block. If there's no more comparisons to be made, then basically, you know, we're going to run everything else in the else statement. Got it? Cool. See, I didn't even get this far in the first Python workshop. We're already done section six. Look how far we're going. Loops. Um, so in Python, in 
any, any sort of code, sometimes you want to do something over and over and over again, right? It's kind of like a game, if you think about it. Because if you're playing a game like Tetris, right, you don't want one block to fall down and then that be the end of the game. That'd be a really boring game, right? You want blocks to keep falling down, right, in a specific order. And a game usually doesn't stop until you lose. And usually, the way it doesn't stop and it keeps generating those blocks of Tetris is through a loop. Loops are important because you want to repeat it multiple times without making your code base like a thousand lines long, right? You may or may not know how many cycles to run through the operation. Um, so this is going to be deciding on whether you use a while loop, you call it a while loop, or a for loop, right? There's a lot of words here. While loops are basically what you use when you don't know when something is going to end, right? So like in Tetris, the top Tetris players in the world can play for like hours on end without losing, right? So we don't know when to end the game. We only end the game if the you know, player loses and the blocks go up to the top, right? So in that case, while loops, we're going to put a condition in it, right? In this case, the condition is it raining. But in our case, for the Tetris game, we're going to say, has the blocks reached the top yet? If not, we're going to keep the game going. We're going to keep dropping random blocks, right? But if the player is bad, like me, and uh, loses in the first five seconds and the block goes to the top, then we're going to end the game, right? So while loops, we use it when we don't know when the thing is going to end, when we don't know when the loop is going to stop. But while loops still have conditions, right? The other type of for, the other type of loop is the for loop. Now, for loop, we usually use when we know when something is going to stop. Sort of like, I need to get five eggs out of the refrigerator. So I can use a for loop to get one egg at a time five times, right? Because I know I'm going to end up with five eggs. I know what the outcome is going to be. Therefore, I don't have to, you know, use a while loop. Although you can, though, keep that in mind. For loops come in multiple different types. Now, you can use for loops like this. I is going to be your variable that you store it in. So it's an uh, arbitrary variable in range five, right? In this case, your in range is going to determine how many times it loops. In this case, it's five times. You can also use for i in range. In this case, it would go from zero to five, and then it would loop every single thing inside of it, right? In this case, if I, tell, if I asked you, how many times does this loop? What would you say? What was your answer? Would it loop six times or would it loop five times? The real question is, is five exclusive? John? You're correct. Five is exclusive. So it goes zero, one, two, three, four, and then doesn't do five. So this would still loop five times. Now, if you started from one, then it would loop four times. So in this case, these are basically the same thing, right? You can also do for i and list. This is a cool one because if you have a list of numbers you want to iterate over, Python just allows you to go ahead and do like a for i in list structure right here, right? And i is going to represent each item in the list. It's good for automating, yes. No. So you would need. Um, one to six, for example. Um, you would need to change this definition, right? By default, it's exclusive. Usually that doesn't come, that's not a problem though. <laughs> okay, now I apologize to anyone who is brand new at coding because I know I'm going extremely fast, but there is a part after this I do want to cover before we get into Pygame, just so that no one is like extremely confused. This was one I'm gonna speed through. Functions um, are blocks of code that are repeated. Now, usually it's not like a uh, it's not like a while loop in which you know. Let me just show this picture here. It's usually multiple lines of code, and you can do stuff like passing parameters. This is like the most important part. In a function, you can name a function to do something. You can pass in things to the function, so it's like completely separate blocks of code, and then you can do things to it and return something. These are the most important parts of a function. It's kind of like uh, a machine in a factory, right? You put something inside the machine, the machine does something to the thing you put in, and it spits it back out, right? 
So a function is really important because you can do things like this and avoid things like this. They're the same code, they do the same thing, but the one on the right just has a crap ton of redundancy. In, redund in code, we just say redundancy as things that could be simplified, you know, things that would slow down your code. Remember, we want million dollar code, not one dollar code. Parts of a function, um, pr pretty simplistic, as I would say. Uh, in Python, it's really easy. Def just says it's a function. It's going to say that what you're going to create next is a function. Your name of the function is going to come next, and then anything you want to pass into the function. Think of like your, your meat machine at the factory, right? You toss in big chunks of meat, it spits out a hot dog. So this is your big chunks of meat, right? Num one, num two. You're going to do something to the big chunks of meat, whether it's like putting it in a casing, mashing it up, adding butter, uh, whatnot. And then at the output of the machine, it's going to give you something, right? In this case, it's going to return answer, right? Return is the output of a function. Now, in other coding language, you might need to define like what data type it is. Python doesn't care. You just got to make sure you know what you're doing. Black box theory, this is not just for programming, this is for everything else in life, because if you're in engineering or if you're doing a project, you're going to need this a lot. Generally, a good process to do things in is to say, okay, um, I have a problem, right? Let me think of something. I suck at making my bed. There we go. So the problem in this case is I'm really bad at making my bed because, I don't know, my sheets never, uh, you know, cover the entirety of the bed. That's the problem. Now, the way I fix the problem is the black box. This is the solution, right? And what I need to put into uh, the problem to fix it, and what I get out of the output is what I need to figure out next. Because when you're solving a problem, you don't want to attack the problem first. You want to figure out everything that's surrounding it, because those are the tools that you'll need to fix your problem. So in this case, I can't make my bed. I suck at making my bed. That's the problem, right? Output. I want a nicely, neatly uh, made bed with a clean cover without any wrinkles, and I want my pillows to be fluffed. I want my um, sheets to be made. That's the output. That's what I want, right? Input. What do I have to put into this problem to fix it? Right? Whether that's money, whether that's time, whether that's like tutoring for bed making practices, you know, or just like general practice yourself, what do I need to put in to fix the problem? Right? After I figure out what my input and outputs are, then I can actually work on fixing the problem. If my input is, let me just practice over and over again, right? And then I can go ahead and say, okay, so what methods do I need to practice in? Like, how do I need to fix the bed? What, how do I need to, you know, put every corner in the right place to fix the bed, right? How do I, and then like some, somewhere in here, I figure out that, oh, my sheets aren't large enough. That's why my bed's not being made properly. So then solution gets, uh, it gets a bigger sheet, uh, the bigger sheet works, and the output is a nicely made bed. Kind of a convoluted example, but, you know, in functions, it's a lot more simple, right? Black box is going to be your function content. It's going to be your adding stuff, right? Inputs are, are going to be your parameters, your meat that you toss into the, to the factory machine. Output's going to be your hot dogs, right? And you can do this again and again. And it never gets old or stops working because it's an infinitely uh, cool machine that does whatever you want. Like I said, as long as you know your inputs and outputs, your function should be easy to make, as for any other project you do, right? Just understand what you need what you want, the rest should come naturally. Also, showing someone the black box actually makes things a lot clearer. Because when you talk about your problem to someone else, like verbally, sometimes you just solve it yourself without knowing it. Like, I've done that a lot of times, right? You don't want to stare at a problem for hours on end and not know what's going on. OK, now that I've blazed through, how much time do I have left? OK, good, 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 good. Let's go over Pygame fundamentals. This is like the new stuff that you haven't seen last semester, so this will be fun. We're doing game development this semester, so we're developing a game. When we're developing a game, we have to work with a user interface. Now, user interfaces come in all shapes and sizes, like your iPhone home screen or the McDonald's menu, right? The new touchscreen menu they have. Or uh, multi-sim, different programs you use in classes, uh, MATLAB. Those all have user interfaces, right? User interfaces contain things like buttons, labels, slide switches, uh, labels, dates that you can look at, big game over screens, whatever the case might be, it's information that you give to the user so the user knows what's going on. Because let me tell you, if you're ever programming something and you're programming something for a user, you always got to go with the fact that you 
you just assume that they're stupid because you're just going to mess up your code in any way, shape or form. Like no matter how obvious you're going to make it, like press this big button right here, the user will find a way to press the exit button and crash the game. No, no, call them stupid. Call them stupid. No, I am a user of a lot of things. And I think my, I, whenever I use something, I think I'm stupid because I always break it. For so, like, it doesn't matter what it is. Like the, I broke a McDonald's menu once. That's why I use that example. Like the thing just stopped working. I mean, like there's that, like there's also people who would intentionally destroy. Yeah, that that is true. Just to scratch that. That is true. That is true. <laughs> so that is a good point, actually. Like when you want to beta test your code, give it to someone else to test because most of the time they'll find something wrong with it, and then you thank them for it. It's kind of like how. Uh, Someone actually, I think it was you, right? You said my, one of my posters for the workshops was wrong. Yeah. 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 I, said it was wrong. Yeah, I mistakenly like put something that shouldn't be there, and uh, debugs tested it. So you know, it's a really good way to again work with others. I think I said this in the general meeting. Yeah, that's, that's true. And also, like, even if you think like would you give it like other people, like they they don't know about like you know the, the topic that your program is about. Like, I think that's even a better way. Yeah. So, like that's also a good way of like you know just give it to your mom or your dad or like people in your family who tested it. Your your your, your program free end to end to end user like end, end user like you know thing. So why not? Yeah, that is extremely true. Um, I once had a screwdriver, and I don't know if you guys know anything about screwdriver. I, I bought an electric screwdriver, right? And this thing came with no manual. So obviously, it should be pretty simple to know how to use a screwdriver. But this screwdriver had these little like things called bits that you put at the end, so you can screw different things in. And uh, when I used the screwdriver, the ends kept falling out because I just assumed there was no magnet, right? There was like nothing to hold this bit in when I was screwing upside down, so it would keep falling out. And I was like, this thing is pretty useless. Turns out, and this was after six months of using the screwdriver, you had to like pull out the top to lock in the bit. Nowhere did I say that. Like, I just found that out and I was like, is this common knowledge? Apparently it was, but is this common knowledge? So having users be able to use your app, you know, before, like with, with no instruction manual is like really important. Like they can read the instructions on the spot, but you know, put a user manual in your screwdriver next time, actually read those things. <laughs> okay, anyways, back to Pygame. So we're gonna creating, be creating a user interface today. A user interface needs graphics, right? And interestingly enough, uh, the coordinate plane inside of Pygame OpenCVTK Inter or any other computer program uh, is a little bit different because it starts from the top left corner and goes down as positive and right as positive. Now, you're not used, used to this, right? This is like the fourth quadrant in uh, Algebra 2. But this is actually has a really good reason. Actually, it's a really stupid reason. But back in 1980, it was a really good reason. Reason for it is because when they developed these cathode ray tube displays, they needed this kind of format to be able to make it work. And under this slide, I actually linked a Stack Overflow link explaining it more because I don't have experience to. But after this cathode ray tube displays, they just like kept it for some reason. And it was a convention that made itself into like modern day libraries and dependencies. So in today, we have Pygame, TK Inter, OpenCV, and even LCDs all use this kind of like numbering format where right is positive and down is positive, which makes it a little bit difficult because we're all used to right is positive, up is positive, right? So you got to kind of flip that y axis in your brain when you're working with coordinates in Pygame or OpenCV or TK Inter. Just remember, the y axis is flipped, which, you know, is kind of a struggle actually because I, I keep messing that up. Movement standards, again, to move right, you add x. To move left, you subtract x. Now, here's the tricky part. To move up, you want to subtract y. To move down, you add y. When you're making a game, placing everything onto what's known as a canvas or your main window requires these coordinates, right? So if you want to put a button in the center of the screen, then you have to find the coordinate in the center of the screen and put it there, right? To find this, you got to go, OK, let's say this is going to be 240 and then 320, again, positive 320, but we're going down. So it's kind of a brain trip, but I still haven't gotten used to it. So I, I, don't, I don't blame you if you mess up too. 
Okay, that was it for that slide. But any questions on this? Pretty simple. Just remember that top left corner is origin. And then right and then down is positive. Okay. Next thing we're going to talk about is RGB color theory. And the whole point of this section is to throw a bunch of concepts at you that you need to understand before doing game development. RGB is one of them. If you want to color something inside of a game, you have to represent it using RGB, which is three numbers that represent red, green, and blue, and the combinations between them. To represent, represent this, the numbers are going to be from 0 to 255, which is an 8-bit range. Um, and you can take a look at how it is in the cube. But you know, a lot of times you can just guess and check you know, the RGB values and see if it's the color you want. Or I linked a website in the uh, description box of this slide that you can go to to figure it out. RGB's friend is HSV, huge saturation and value. And that's another topic for another day. But there's a lot of color theory concepts that go into way more depth as to how to color things inside your game. State machines. So we're going into a little bit of complex, control, uh, complex theory here with state machines. But state machines are generally a pretty entertaining topic anyway. So uh, we'll talk about them for a bit. The reason I go over this is because today one of the uh, sprites that we're going to use inside the game require a state. A state is kind of a, I say it's a dis discrete model, but it's just a pain in the butt uh, to represent different actions. Uh, the race car didn't change that, but the sprite decides to take depending on the environment it's in. So think of it like different behaviors or different actions you take, right? Like actions like me getting out of the bed, me brushing my teeth, me eating breakfast, right? Depending on what's going on throughout the day, I'm not always going to eat, wake up, brush my teeth, eat breakfast, go to school, right? Some days I wake up, I, I, I realize that I oversleep, and then I have to wake up, brush my teeth, and then go to school directly without eating breakfast. It's not like a linear like train of thought, right? You can kind of jump around based on what happens. So state machines are unique. And the three things you got to know about state machines are the behavior, which is the action that you take. So like me brushing my teeth, me eating breakfast, me going to school. The transition, or what causes me to eat breakfast, or what caused me to go directly from brushing my teeth to school is the amount of time I have, right? Or how early I wake up in the morning. And the outputs are the states. It's the result of what the sprite does or decides to do based on the data input. Again, depending on how early I wake up or how early my school is or how much I oversleep, I will do different things during the day. And the things I do are the states, right? So I could have a wake up state. I could have a brush my teeth state. I could have an eat breakfast state. This diagram explains it pretty well. So in this case, this describes a, a race car doing autonomous driving in a course. So here, the search state will be the race car wandering randomly. The goal is to park the race car in front of a cone. So in this case, the transitions to get out of the state are, it's about to hit something or it detects cone, right? That's the arrow pointing out of the state machine. Usually you'll see it written like this. If it's about to hit something, it's going to go to obstacle, right? An obstacle, it's going to turn to avoid the obstacle. And the only way to get out of the state is to make sure that the obstacle is out of sight, right? That's its transition. That's like the if statement, right? If the obstacle is out of sight, it goes back to search. This basically the same theory for the entire flowchart if you want to go through it yourself. But state machines are pretty cool. Now, the state machine we're going to use today is not this complicated. It only has two states. But it's still good to understand where it comes from and how it differentiates from an if statement. OK, game physics. The next type is um, a little bit of math. Now, computer, a lot of people who go into computer science complain that there's math to it, because honestly, like you kind of need it um, if you're making like a physics-based game. So things like platformers, things like Angry Birds, that's a physics-based game, right? Two-dimensional physics. Um, things like three-dimensional physics, uh, what's a three-dimensional game? Fortnite's the first thing that comes to mind. You jump around in Fortnite, those physics have to come from somewhere. Um, so today, we're going to be making a two-dimensional game. So we're just going to go over these following ones real quick. If you took like elementary physics, you should know this. Uh, if you took like fifth grade math, you should know this. Uh, dimensions are how many axes describe the game. So based on the complexity of the game you're making, uh, the number of axes or the number of motions you're going in will vary, right? You have 2D games, you have 3D games, you even have 4D games sometimes, which is like interesting because you know it's not a dimension we can perceive. But there are games in 4D uh, that play with time and stuff. It's like pseudo 40. 
Position is the location of an object along an axis. So a number like 320 to describe the location of the x, of the object along the x axis would be that. And let's say 320 along the y axis would be the location of the uh, object on the y axis. Velocity, uh, I also re refer to this as the delta. So uh, in the guide I will post after this, uh, sometimes I say this is the delta because velocity is the change in position, right? Change in position uh, along an axis. Now, typically, when we change this delta value inside the code, it will be because we want things to move, right? And uh, to make things move, we just use this value to add onto the position. From basic kinematics, that's usually how you do things, right? Acceleration is a change in velocity along an axis, uh, which isn't going to be used today, but uh, is also the der derivative of velocity. And the distance formula, which everyone should probably have a good idea of, is calculating the distance between two points. I put this word threshold here because this isn't just game physics, but this is also understanding pi game physics, so game development physics. We use the word threshold to describe exactly what the error margin is or what we're allowed to have the error margin as when doing things like collisions. Because collisions in games is kind of tricky because you don't want to have a collision threshold of a zero. We'll talk about that a little bit later, though. The last two points we have here are kinematic equations, differential equations, which can get you from position, position velocity acceleration and back to acceleration velocity position. Um, and also trigonometry, polar coordinates. This one is also really good if you're making anything that turns inside of a game, because then you have to calculate something, some angles and whatnot. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's not too bad. Um, so if you want to go into game development, don't let this math scare you. Uh, it's not that bad, <laughs> but there is physics. There is some math. And the cool thing about it is because you can put it in code too. So it's coding math. How fun is that? Sprites. Let's talk about sprites. Sprites are game objects with programmable behaviors. So game objects are things like images or characters you put into the game. Think of Angry Birds, right? The red bird or the yellow bird, they are sprites because they are characters in the game and they are objects that interact with behaviors. In Angry Birds, those wood blocks, those stone blocks, those glass blocks that the birds hit to, to uh, pop the pigs, those are sprites too because they interact with other things. Pretty much anything interactable inside a game is called a sprite, including the background, including the music, right? So for each object, I'm going to focus on characters here, uh, the behaviors or properties of a sprite are stored in variables. So for example, I'm going to use an enemy, right? Let's say I make an enemy uh, called invader, and this Invader has a few properties, like the actual image that corresponds to the invader, or the x and y coordinates that it's initialized on. Or, again, here we have x change and y change. This is, again, the delta, right? This is how much velocity that these numbers will change by. And also the number of invaders, or number of enemies, we have eight. Now, all of these can change inside the while loop, but we need to describe them because it describes kind of like the properties of a character. It's kind of like describing the properties of someone you know, like they have black hair, they have glasses, they have a mouth, they have a nose, they eat, hopefully. Um, so yeah, sprites. You guys know this guy? Scratch Cat, right? I started programming or learning how to program back in middle school on Scratch. I still have some Scratch projects and remixes on. It's good, it's good program, but this is like when you, when you think of Sprite, this is like the first character I think of because you know the Scratch tutorial literally melts into your head if you have done it before. This is really important. Okay, I'm gonna put it on my mouse here. Get serious. Start update paradigm is incredibly important. Paradigm just means pattern, right? This is a specific type of timing pattern that is used in game development or OpenCV or things that need to happen repeatedly, right? So. Not unlike normal code in which it just goes from like top to bottom and you run it once, this is a way for games or like other robotics programs to be able to run repeatedly and have different things happen to them on each run. Basically, a live detection feature or live change. It happens in two stages. The first stage is the start stage, or also known as the setup stage. It happens once during the code. It is used for initializing things, basically initial behaviors, uh, initial variables, initial states initial class object declarations, it happens once. So after the start update, or after the start function happens once, then it moves on to the update. Update 
is basically a while loop, right? A while loop that loops all over and over and over and over again, right? In here it says the clock speed is like 60 hertz, but uh, maybe slower due to calculations and done in the inside function. Pretty much when we have a game like Tetris, remember that Tetris example? We want the game to keep running over and over and over again. We don't just want to have one block drop and done, right? So in order for us to have more blocks run over and over and over again, we need to have a while loop, right? Because we don't know when the game's gonna end. We don't know when the guy's gonna lose because he's uh, number one Tetris player in the world. So this function's gotta run over and over again. So the timing pattern inside games is literally just something happens once at the start and then you loop and every single time you go inside the loop, you have to change something, right? You have to like respond to the user's input. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, in general, this is like how things work for, for games. Now, this last point here is kind of important. Start update or the update function or a while loop has no memory. You can't save data inside a while loop because after it loops back around, it's gonna forget everything. It's kind of like a goldfish. It has very, like, is no memory. So do not save data inside this function. But you may ask, if we can't save data inside this loop, how are we going to remember or how are we going to react to what the user does? Right? Anyone have any thoughts? Yeah? Save file? <laughs> save file is a good, uh, actually, it's pretty much exactly what it is, actually. Uh, it's not called save file, though, but that's a good thought. What happens is you use what's called a global variable, right? Now, if I can't save an object inside of a while loop, what if I basically say inside my while loop, because of my short term memory, I write something down on a piece of paper, right? Then the next time I loop back around and forget everything, I can say, oh, I wrote this down on a piece of paper. That means I know what's going on, right? It's kind of saving your memory. Um, you guys ever watch Groundhog Day? That, that, that movie when they like loop over and over and over again on that one single day? Yeah, the, the, that concept is kind of like the same thing, except like you can save your memory in like a global scope. Scope is going to be the locations where a variable can be accessed. So uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult to understand if you don't have a fundamental understanding of variables just yet. Um, but pretty much it says if a variable is used inside of a function, it cannot be used outside of a function. If you create the variable inside the while loop, you can't use it outside of the while loop, right? So if I'm already looping, you know, you, through this like memory lapse sort of amnesia loop, and I write something down inside of that memory loop. The next time I loop back around, it's going to be gone. Because you've got to create that save file before you start looping, right? Global is the keyword that allows variables to be accessed from everywhere. In Python, you've got to use it to save stuff. Right. So in this example, I have stated global x. So x is a global variable. And I say x is fast. Now, this function happens where it says def change speed, and it goes x equals slow, right? So this function, what it does is it changes the x, which is, again, a variable, which is, again, a box. Remember? So it's going to change x to slow inside the function, and it's going to call the function. Now, the question is, after this function has been called and this print statement is activated, what will the print statement say? The race car is, and the two answers are fast or slow. Slow, and why would it be slow? That's a good idea. That's a good idea. It's slow too? Oh, it's global. It is global, right? It is a global X. Unfortunately, what happens is that it's not defined globally inside the function. Remember, functions are like a goldfish. If you don't define the variable, it doesn't know what it is. So it thinks x is a new variable. What happens is it assigns it to a different place in memory, but called the same name. Think of it like if you know people with the same name, like I know a bunch of Chris's, right? You probably know a Chris or two. How do you differentiate between Chris's, right? You, you have like different places in your memory for them. That's kind of like how this is. So this x might be stored in the memory address 0x01, right? It's stored in memory address 1. But here, because you don't link this x to the outside, it's going to be stored in a different location, like in 2. But they still have the same name. They still have x, right? If you go into like lower level programming, you'll understand really quickly that 
these names are just to help us as humans understand code. They mean nothing to the machine. This X can mean completely different than this X in some states. So in this case, after the explanation, what should the race car be? Fast, right? Good. Now, here's the corrected version. If I put global X right before slow, now this tells the function, hey, I'm using global X. I'm using the X that was stated outside of the function, right? So when this is called, it's going to use global X, which X is equal to slow. Therefore, the print statement is going to be what? Slow, right? Because it changes the exact address of X that was called in the very beginning. Very important concept to know because if you don't do this, sometimes you'll start creating random variables that have no like actual linkage and your code is going to implode on itself. Okay, how much time do I have? Oh. Uh, 36 minutes? Good. Yes? I have a question about the global and slow. When would you do that in the typing analysis? Would you use global and slow in the slow? Because then you want to try to rewild it to the next level? That is a good point. Yes, that's a good example, actually. Score is one of those things where you want to have it globally because it updates based on what happens inside the while loop, right? So if you know you're you get a Tetris line and you get some score, your score has to be created before you even start playing the game, right? Or else inside the while loop, it's gonna reset to zero every single time you get a line. Scope is just a conceptual thing. Yeah. So scope defines like where you can access it. So in, in your example, if you put score as a global variable, then you can access score wherever in the code, right? The thing about this is um, you got to be careful because global, you only use it when editing a variable. So if you're just referencing a variable inside the function, like let's say I'm going to do print x inside of here, in Python, it actually will print fast inside the function. It's a bit weird. So only global when editing a variable. So it doesn't accidentally create a new one. All right. Yes. You would have to define it as global because you didn't return it. Okay. Unless if you return it and then you say x is equal to change speed x and you return x, then it would be it would be slow in this example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. The question was if you had x as a parameter inside change speed, uh, you would need to return the results of x equals slow before you can make the change. Otherwise, you can still have global here and it would still read slow, but uh, it's not an efficient way to do it. You know, usually you can't pass parameters into like a while loop, you know. All right, you guys excited? We're going to design our game. <laughs> All right, so here's what we're going to do. You guys ever play Space Invaders? That like one game where you have like a rocket ship on the bottom, it shoots like uh, the invaders. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to code up Hyperloop Invaders instead. So here's the situation. You are stranded on a deserted space station fixing a broken satellite with no way of communicating back to home base. This satellite is your only way of reaching back home. Well, I have a Zoom message. Ancient. <laughs> yes, ancient. You are halfway done fixing the satellite when suddenly you hear the sudden entrance of the dreaded loop invaders. The loop. So today's workshop, we're going to be going over fundamental Python concepts and adding on the applications of Pygame to create a small video game to represent this exact scenario. So we're going to use everything we talked about so far. To plan, you know, it's a really good idea to plan out your game before you actually do things. So we're, all of us at a group, we're going to go ahead and just plan this game out first. So what sprites would we need for this game? Anyone can answer. What optics? The bullet. The bullet, yes, the bullet, good. That's one. There are three. Yeah, good, okay, <laughs> you got it. Basically, the player ship, the bullet, the enemy ship, right? There's three. What audio samples would we need for this game? We wanna make this interesting, right? So what audio would we have? Crash, yes. You, like let's say we lose lose the game, that's a good like, game loss sound. Or we can have the bullet hit the plane, that's another sound. 
Anything else? Every time you fire. Every time you fire, good, that's one. Anything else? These are four. Background music, I like that. Yes, four, yes, exactly. You know, fire, firing noise, background music, death noise for enemy, death noise prepare, and the game over sound, right? So just a few things when thinking about making a game before you actually start. Because like, you know, I gave you a folder with assets. That's what this stuff is. But if you were to like look it up yourself, it would take a fair amount of time. What environmental properties do we need to set up beforehand? It's a difficult question. So before we even like put the sprites into the game, before we even do anything else, what do we need? So game concepts. Yeah. Uh, black background color. Back, black background color. Yes, good. Background is always important. Yep. Dimensions, good. Yes, dimensions is a good one. I actually don't have that, so I think that's a really good answer. Dimensions. Anyone else? Start position, good. All, yes, that's a very good one. You want to make sure everything starts from the right place. You can have a level system if you want your game. We don't have enough time for a level system, unfortunately, today. But yeah, you definitely want multiple scenes. If we want multiple different levels, we call them multiple scenes. Anyone else? That's a good one, although I don't think it's the environmental properties. Um, I think it's more or less in the a, loop. Enemy spawn position. Enemy spawn position, good, yes. Uh, what about the scoring system? Right? We need to make sure that exists before we actually do anything, right? Oh, that's the answer, by the way. I like the dimensions one. That was a good one. <laughs> Sprite behavior. So something else we need to consider is how things move. And that, that's where we're moving into, right? What behavior does the player have and what constraints does it have? Yeah, that's a good one. If they hit the enemies, they'll die. Anything else? Move uh, left and right and fire. Move left and right and fire. Good. So the player can only move on the x-axis, does not move on the y-axis. And I like the answer. If it hits the thing, they'll die. What behavior does the bullet have? This bullet right here that comes from the ship. Because it's a sprite too, right? It moves. What constraints does it have? Good. You can only move in the y-axis. Yeah. Good. It can only originate from the flight. Good. That's a good one. To be a little more specific on that, it can only follow the player's x-axis, right? So its x position must depend on where the player is. What behavior does the enemy have? Yeah, that's a good one. It can only move towards the player. So would that be adding or subtracting the y-axis? Adding, right? Because that was positive. <laughs> Good one. So what behavior does the enemy have? OK, can only move in certain intervals of time. What interaction does the enemy have with the bullet? Right, so if the bullet comes into collision threshold with the Hyperloop symbol, then the Hyperloop symbol and the bullet will be gone. Awesome. Moves in a predetermined pattern. When the enemy contacts a bullet, disappears from the game, score increases by one. When the enemy reaches the bottom of the screen, the game is over. OK. I think this is uh, going to be it for now. OK. So we're going to go ahead and start coding this game. I think I'm actually doing well on time, surprisingly. Um, but I am, in case I don't get to finish, I'm going to say this now. We are going to have a Hyperloop game jam. So after this workshop, You'll get the source code for my game. Um, you'll also get the assets and a tutorial on how to make the game. And you're going to remix or create your own Pi game game for the Hyperloop game jam. So pretty much just submit a zip file of your uh, game at the very end uh, to 
me or one of the Hyperloop eBoard members will uh, will make a collaborative uh, website for it and we'll host it. And you'll be able to play your game and all everyone else's games uh, and it'll be a lot of fun. So just a basic, um, what we did here was pretty much game planning. You're gonna do that yourself. Uh, but you're gonna go ahead and answer these questions. Basically, what's the core concept of your game? Do you want to keep the same principle of uh, shooting things, like Hyperloop Invaders, or you wanna do something else like asteroids? That one's a bit more complicated, but doable. How do you win or how do you lose? What sprites do you need for your game? What audio samples do you need for your game? Or what behavior does each of your sprites have in relation to game flow? You know? So good questions to think about. All right. So now we'll get to the exciting part of, the, uh, of, of today's workshop, which is actually making the game. Let me just get prepped here. OK. So all of you should have Visual Studio Code downloaded. So at this point, go ahead and uh, create a new file. Call it like hyperloopinvaders.py or like a main.py file. You just need one Python file to carry out all your code. Now, the position of this uh, file is kind of important. Uh, let me go ahead and just one more time before I close out the main bar. Zoom, guys, you can hear me, right? Yeah, because this is going to screw up something. Screen, make sure that everything's right. Okay. Eddie, if they say anything, anything let me know. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to go away. Uh, hide floating mean controls. All right. So I use GitHub Desktop. And if you read through the guide on how to install GitHub, you'll, you'll, you'll see me complaining about some of it. Uh, complaining about Git in general. So generally, there's like command line Git, and there's also uh, GitHub Desktop, which is like easier to use. Uh, it's very user friendly. There's big, huge buttons that tell you where to go. If you want to learn more about Git, I gave an introduction in that. Uh, document, but you can also look on the Git documentation and do that too. It's a great tool for version control. Great tool for showing off to your future employers. So what I'm going to do is from here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go to repository, open in Visual Studio Code, and I'm going to open this project in VSC. Now again, in VSC, all of the um, files are stored in, in this kind of format. It's called a workspace, right? That's where all files are stored. Let's move this over here. Okay, I believe this is the correct version. If it's not, then I'll fix it later. So you should be seeing something like this on the side here. Maybe your files are a little bit minimized, but generally you want to create um, your new file right outside of the assets folder. This is gonna be really important. I'm just gonna call it uh, workshop.py. You want to make it make sure it's like outside of your assets inside of your main folder. If it's not, then move it there. So if you close your assets folder, you should still be able to see the workshop.py folder. One of the things we didn't talk about in the in the lecture, but I'm going to tell you this now, is pathing is important. Basically, finding the location of your file is something that the program will need to do to be able to find your assets, you know, eventually. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start by importing some important material. So under workshop up high, we're going to do import pi game, import random, import math, and import, uh, we're going to do from pi game, import mixer. So really quickly, um, your library should light up green like that, pretty much saying that your Visual Studio Code terminal recognizes it. If it doesn't, try running the code anyway. Make, maybe it will go ahead and recognize it. But if you go ahead and run your code and it doesn't pop up with any errors, you're good to go. We can move on. Okay. Now, just a brief description of what this thing is. By the way, everyone, in, even in the back, you can see the code, right? Okay, good. So, import pi game. Obviously, we know what pi game is. We're using it for making a game. Uh, random is going to be a library to make pseudo random and random numbers. Why do I say pseudo random? Because sometimes random numbers aren't actually random, right? Sometimes they're pseudo-random, which means uh, they come in the same pattern every single time you run the code uh, because it's just a little bit dumb. Like, random numbers are kind of dumb. So in order to get real random numbers, you need to seed it with an uh, initial seed. And I can go into like a gruesome detail about that, but I don't think it's important. Random just generates random numbers, all right? 
Math will give you uh, will give you access to mathematical functions that don't come in the default Python installation. So, for example, uh, things like exponents, right? Math.pow doesn't come in Python. Square root, math.square root doesn't come in the doesn't come with Python. We're going to need math because we're going to use distance formula to calculate this, the distance between a bullet and the enemy. And if we don't have those functions, it's going to be really hard to figure out what's what. And finally, from Pygame Import Mixer, this is the reason why I asked you guys to restart your computers, because this is going to allow us to have sound inside of our code, which sound is good because sound makes our game less boring. So those are our four dependencies. And after we finish that, we can now go ahead and start with the rest. So the first thing we're going to do is initialization and structure. So the first thing we're going to do is initialize Pygame, right? So we're going to do pygame.init. It's really funny because init stands for initialization, but saying it also makes you sound like a British person. Uh, we're going to create the screen next. Because remember, uh, we have to make sure the dimensions of the uh, game are correct. So in this case, I'm going to use uh, these variables screen width. Oops. I'm going to set this to 800. And I'm going to set this screen height to 600. OK? What I'm going to do next is I'm going to go ahead and do the caption. Whoa, oh, I deleted that. We're going to make the caption an icon for my window. So in this case, I'm going to do pygame. Py uh, dot display dot set underscore caption and then I'm going to call this hyperloop invaders I think it has a cool ring to it don't you say initialize just to make sure we're all on the same page zoom everyone you can see the screen right Okay. Now, since this is the initialization section after all, we have to go ahead and figure out how to actually run this thing to be able to see if this thing works. So we're going to go ahead and say running equals true, and this is going to be a flag. Now remember, the flags in coding are pretty much booleans that tell us like whether something is true or false, like a yes or no question. So this is going to tell us whether the game is running or not. I'm going to do while running. We're going to py, do pygame.display.update. Now, this line is going to pretty much go ahead and update everything on our window. So if we go ahead and press play, uh, display mode not set. Oh, OK, I missed, the, I missed the line. So under its create screen, I set the dimensions for the screen, but I didn't actually create it. So we, what we have to do is do screen equals pygame.display.set underscore mode, and then we're going to set it to the screen width and the screen height. Like that. Now you'll notice there's a bunch of different pretty colors on my screen. Uh, if I hover over like a function, it'll actually tell me what the parameters are for that, right? That's IntelliSense. It's really cool because it knows what the function is from pygame, and so it'll tell me what the parameters are and what it spits it out. This right here, this arrow tells me what it's going to return, right? I don't know what surface it is, but I can click see world, real world examples from GitHub if you want to. Now, if I go ahead and press play, I will get a black screen. And this black screen, it's supposed to happen. It's going to crash. Just like ignore it. Just press, uh, just close the program. It's not going to do anything yet until we go ahead and put some sprites in. But it's good because a screen popped up. So we're already on the right track. What we're going to do next is right under the caption and icon, we need to make sure we have access to our assets. So we're going to put some references for sprites. And this will save us a lot of time when actually getting them in the future. So we have three sprites for Hyperloop Invaders. We have the player. And this is going to be a really long line, so uh, I'm going to go slow here. So pygame.transform.scale. And then pygame.image.load. And then I'm going to go ahead and put the path, which is assets slash image slash robotics transparent dot PNG. Okay. And then 
I'm going to resize this to 75 pixels by 75 pixels. The reason why we have to do this is because the robotics logo is huge. And we can't have that inside of our game. So we're just going to scale it down to 75 pixels by 75 pixels. All right. Now we're going to do the same thing for the other sprites. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy this and paste it a few times. We're going to do one for the enemy. And we're going to do one for the bullet. Right. And the enemy is going to be the loop logo. So I'm going to do hyperloop underscore transparent dot PNG. And the bullet is going to be called yellow late underscore laser dot PNG. Okay. I'm going to make the enemy 150 by 100 pixels. I'm going to make the bullet 50 by 50. Now remember that everything in this uh, pie game is measured in pixels. So if I go to assets and image, I can actually see which images I am working with. So I guess the Hyperloop one, the robotics one, and a yellow laser. All right. So now we've directed the code towards the place in which we are going to get the images. We're going to run one thing in the terminal, right? We're going to do CD space and then the folder name. This is just... Actually, you might not need to do this, but I'm going to do this because my path is not in the right place yet. To make sure your path is right, just look at this last folder here. Mine's 4x01 full code, and just make sure your file is inside of it. If your file is inside of it, then you're in the right place because if you're, you're going to be able to find this code. Your code is going to be able to find the picture, sorry. Otherwise, you might run into some errors. So what we're going to do next is we're going to initialize things. We're going to initialize behaviors. We're going to initialize things like score, uh, the background, and some music. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and initialize the score. I'm going to make a uh, variable called score value here. And the score value is going to initialize at zero, right? Because we, we don't want a score initially. And I'm going to put the score in the location 5, 5. Can someone tell me which corner of the screen this is going to be put in? Correct. Top left. Good. And I'm going to make the font pygame.font.font. Weird. Um, free sans bold dot tff. TTF. 64. Right. 64 is the new pixel size. So keep, in, keep that in mind. OK, I'm also going to initialize the other piece of text I'm going to have in my game, which is the game over screen, right? So game over. And game over is going to be game underscore over underscore font equals pi game dot font dot font. Again, weird. Free sans bold dot TTF. 64. Oh, the first one's 20. See, I'm, even I'm having tunnel vision. That was an inside joke. OK, so we have declared settings for these fonts, but we need to go ahead and state exactly um, how to put them on the screen, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to make functions for them. In this case, I'm going to do show underscore score. Um, I'm going to put x and y in there just to put as parameters. I'm going to do score is going to equal font.render points. And then I'm going to put plus string score underscore value. Okay. I'm going to make this true. And the color is going to be 255, 255, 255. Okay. Based on this data here, uh, what am I missing? Why is it mad at me? Oh. Okay. Based on this data here, uh, we can see that if we go to font.render, the parameters are um, color value, background color value, none, none, surface. Uh, doesn't tell us much. 
So this second uh, argument, this third argument here, 255, 255, 255, is the RGB value for the score label. So who can tell me what color that is? Is that white? Yes, yeah, white. Um, because uh, RGB are the primary colors of light, so if you mix them all the same amounts, you get white. Yeah, exactly. That's correct. Yeah. So you mix full red, blue, and, yeah. I'm just wondering if that's something that before the show. <laughs> <laughs> does it only take RGB values, or do you, does, it, does it also accept like hex codes or like? Only RGB values. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you want to transform one code to another, there's a library for that. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I want. Yeah. Black is just zero zero zero, right? If there's no color, it's got to be black. If there's all color, it's got to be white. Yeah. So if you have equal amounts of each of them, does it matter what the actual value is? If you have like 20, 20, 20, that's going to be some weird combination of red, green, blue, because it's like twenty percent red, twenty percent green, twenty percent oh, blue. No, 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 no. Uh, so like if you have equal of all of them, and it's going to be a gradient that goes from black to white. Yeah. 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 Uh, and like in the middle, it's like some kind of grayish, like whitish kind of thing. Multiple shades of gray. You can go ahead and look at the. Uh, Technically, 20, 255 shades of gray. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's a good point. It's a good point. All right. So we have this function called show score, uh, and we are going to use the next line here, screen dot lit score, and then we're going to put the tuple in x y. Uh, B lit is an interesting one. I actually didn't know about this until I uh, googled it. Uh, where is it? I know I put B B lit here somewhere. Oh, was it here? Cool. I did put it in my notes. It stands for block transfer. Isn't that cool? Pretty much what happens is that this will put it onto the screen for us. We need to transfer the block from our code to the screen. We use this for text, we use this for pictures, we use this for everything else. Okay, where was I? Okay, so we're going to do this again for the game over screen. So I'm going to copy paste this. The game over screen is not going to change its location, so I'm going to just go ahead and do game underscore over, delete the parameters, and instead of points, I'm going to go ahead and just do game over. Like that. Okay, true, 255, and then this time I'm going to do screen.blit. Instead of putting score, I'm going to put game underscore over underscore text 190 comma 250. This game over text is not a thing because I have to change this. Yeah. Things of copying and pasting code, you know? I think like. Um, you have some kind of feature where you can like just change the name if it appears like you know like if, if it appears like just change change all appearances of like the real words of like yeah. Kind of name of yeah. Score x comma score y. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it inside our while loop. Again, remember the start update paradigm only happens once beforehand. Uh, so everything up here will only occur once, and then after it enters the while loop, this will occur over and over and over again. That's the update part, right? Okay. Now I know I'm running out of time, and this happens way more times than you can count. But uh, before I go, I do want to put some background music because background music is cool and good. It's not that music. <laughs> I'm gonna get copyrighted <laughs> off the face of the earth that I put that in. So. Don't worry. Like YouTube's not gonna like arrive uh, arrive with like a like a whole like what's the term you put in the military but, like a. SWAT. Yeah, a squadron, <laughs> a squadron of like lawyers like knocking on the door and be like, hey, 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 Yeah. So we're gonna we, we can use the mixer library to load some music in. And then we're gonna go ahead and do mixer.music.play. We need to play negative one so it loops. Now, if we run this, what I'm gonna expect to see is things in the while loop. Pretty much I'm gonna probably see my score. That's about it, and I, I'm going to hear some music. So let's see if that works.
It works, you have background music, right? This is copyright free. Okay. So we have completed initialization and structure. Now, in my notes, uh, I have sprites, collision, user control, and constraints into full code. I don't think I'm going to shove that into seven minutes, but I'll try. The next thing we're going to do is define the sprites. Now, the sprites are going to be defined before the while loop starts. So under the background sound, we're going to say uh, define the property as a sprite. Because remember, back when I described sprites for the first time, we say there's a lot of different properties to it, like it's X position, Y position, it's movement, whatnot. So in this case, we're going to do player first. So the player is going to have an image, right? It's going to have its uh, player image, which is going to be player. And again, player, we've predefined this as this location or the image, the PNG inside of the code. We're going to do um, its X position. So player underscore X, we're going to put this at 370. And player underscore Y is going to be at 500. And then player underscore x change equals zero. x change again is the delta for the x axis, basically says at what rate the spaceship will move along the x axis. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to program in the invader or the enemy. Invader is going to be have a couple different properties. Again, remember we have we have multiple different enemies, so that means we have to store these things in multiple different locations. So instead of having just a regular um, variable definition for it, we're going to have instead a list, which is a data structure that contains some things, right? So in this case, the invaders are going to have an X position. They're going to have a Y position. They're going to have a delta for the X position. Change. They're going to have a delta for the Y position. And also, we're going to have a number of invaders, too. Let's keep this at 8. But if you want to make the game more challenging, you can crank it up to like 100 or something. So in order for us to in initialize the position for these invaders, we must go ahead and um, run a for loop. Because if we don't run a for loop, what's going to happen here is uh, we want to create a randomized location for each of these invaders, right? Easiest way for us to do that is using a for loop because we can just loop through eight times and create random locations for each of them. So in our case, we're going to go ahead and do for num in range. And we're going to do number of invaders like that. Again, how many times is this for loop going to run? It's going to run eight times, right? So if I don't have like from zero to eight, right? If I don't have that, you're just gonna assume that whatever number is in there is the number of time it's gonna run. It automatically starts from zero. So in this case, for each of these invaders, what I want to do is I want to do invader image append enemy. Because remember, inside of this invader image list, I'm gonna have a picture of the Hyperloop logo, right? Because Hyperloop is enemy. And then I'm going to go ahead and start appending underscore x dot append random dot rand int. And I'm going to set the invader to a random location in the x axis between 64 and 737. Why are these two numbers? It's in the middle of the screen somewhere. Invader underscore y dot append. Now I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing. Basically, I'm going to take a random number, dot rand int, and then I'm going to put this between 30 and 180. Now, would this number be between, be at the top of the screen or at the bottom of the screen? Top? The origin's on the top left corner, right? So in the y direction, y goes positive down. So a smaller y number would be near the top. It's a bit of a brain baffle, but it's cool. All right. So next, we're going to go ahead and do invader dot, I mean, underscore x change. Basically, we're going to go ahead and append Oops. 1.2. Basically, this is the speed of the invader, right? 1.2 
pixels per second or something. And I don't think it's per second. It's per one over 60th of a second. It's refresh rate. Then we're going to do invader underscore y change dot append 50. That means every time it moves down, it's going to move down 50 pixels, right? OK, now we have created the parameters for the invaders, right? So uh, we've done player. We've done one sprite, which is player. We've done two sprites, which is invader. And now we have to do the third sprite, which is for the bullet. So for the bullet, what we're going to do is, now the bullet's going to be an interesting one because, um, again, remember the bullet has a state, right? The bullet's not going to be like constantly moving every single time. It's going to either be you know firing from the ship or not firing from the ship. Again, think of the state machine. Like I'm either going to eat breakfast or I'm not going to eat breakfast because I overslept. Um, so in that case, we're going to go ahead and define our rest state as bullet is not moving, and our fire state as bullet is moving. All right. Now we're going to do the same thing as the other ones. We're going to say our bullet image is going to be the bullet. I'm going to instantiate bullet underscore x to zero because this will change in the future. Bullet underscore y is going to equal 500. Uh, bullet underscore x change is going to equal zero. And bullet underscore y change is going to equal three. So the bullet's going to move in the y direction uh, by three pixels every 160 of a second, pretty fast. And in addition to this, an extra parameter we're going to give the bullet is its state, right? So I'm going to have a bullet underscore state, and that's going to be rest at default. Depending on what this bullet state is, later on we're going to have some more complex game logic that will decide um, exactly what's going on with this, right? Okay. So. If we run the game right now, nothing fancy is going to happen because we didn't actually put anything in the logic yet. Um, we finished the sprites, I believe. Uh, we've almost finished sprites. So if I can take a few more minutes of your time, we can go ahead and put these sprites on the screen. So again, using the blet function or the block transfer function, we can create functions that places the sprites on the screen using pygame. So this game, we're going to do screen dot blet and this first one's going to be player image um, and then we're going to place it x minus 16 by default and y plus 10 by default like that and i'm going to copy these two more times and it's going to be one for the invader and one for the bullet right so this one's going to be the invader and the invader is going to depend on like another parameter called i, which means because we have multiple different enemies, right? So in this case, uh, we're going to go do screen be lit, and then in this case, going to be the invader. Oh. Ugh. I, it's going to be the invader image. Okay, and then we're going to do x and y. Okay. And this final one is going to be the bullet. And the bullet one is going to be a little bit different because we have to call in the bullet states using the global variable. And for this one, I'm going to go ahead and put the bullet image on the screen. And I'm going to give it a coordinate of x and y. Now, it's interesting that we do this because the way we place these objects on the screen really depends on the game logic. For a bullet, right, the only time the bullet's going to be moving on the screen is if we press fire. So for this function to actually be true, we have to actually have a line here that goes bullet underscore state equals fire. So the bullet fires when we press the space bar or something like that, right? And then um, this places on the screen and it starts moving. Now, if we think of like the game condition, the bullet only vanishes when it hits an enemy or if it hits the top of the screen. So when we code that part in, when it hits the enemy or hits the part of the screen, it will vanish, right? So 
we can go ahead and change the ball space back to rest during that point, but right now we can keep it as fire. So if we go ahead and run this game for the last time of today, we'll see the same thing because we actually haven't coded the placement of it yet. These are just functions, all right? But I will show you what the end result of this is, right? And I have it right here in my test. This is what you guys are working towards. So we have, con we have in this workshop, we have covered about uh, three sections of the tutorial. There is still collision, user control, and constraints to go over, uh, but those will be posted on a document for you to follow after the workshop. Also, I will be recording the rest of this workshop on my own time to post onto the websites. So in case you want a further explanation of what's going on, you can look at two sources. There's no excuse. But without further ado, this is what you're looking towards as the result of your game. It's a relatively simple one, right? But it's Space Invaders, but with uh, the Hyperloop logo and the Robotics logo. Oh yeah, let's see what we have when we lose. Yeah, you can make that more refined, but like... You can change the volume. It's a mixer okay. function. So, oh, <laughs> again, if you want to see more functions, just look at the documentation for it. This is just a brief snapshot of what's going on. Oh my goodness, the documentation is horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I've been using the like doc net recently, and I really love the documentation that they have. When I go back over here, the documentation is like. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it varies per documentation, but yeah. that's that's just that's just what it is. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that will be it for today, everyone. Let me just put it back to the home screen so we can end up on a good note. All right. Well, whoa, almost tripped and fell. Okay, thank you guys so much for coming to today's workshop. It was great seeing you all once more. This is workshop one out of 12 for the semester. Uh, we hope to see you in future workshops. Have a great rest of your night and I will hope to see you later. Bye for now. Bye, Zoom guys.